So, you know, today was interesting. Um, I, for those that were not um, at some of the other sessions I've done today and earlier a couple of days ago, let me just repeat this because it's, it bears repeating. Um, there's a pattern that, that experienced traders have seen over and over and over again. And, um, you know, if you talk to anybody that's been around for more than a decade or two, they will tell you, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and what I'm talking about is this, you know, we get a big number, whatever it is, PPI, CPI, NFP, FOMC, whatever, you know, we get a quote unquote a news announcement on an economic release and the market reacts significantly to it. You know, it almost never doesn't react. There's always a decent reaction one way or the other or both, you know. Uh, as we're in price discovery and pricing it in. And then the next day we get the reaction to the reaction. And for example, there's a pattern that you hear over and over again with ES that if there's a massive one directional move on FOMC day, it's very, very common for that move to be reversed, if not entirely, partially. And guess what? We saw that. Um, and the, the third day is usually when you find value. You know, everything's kind of priced in. So, you know, we have the, the number, the reaction to the number, reaction to the reaction, and then, you know, we get to value. Well, guess what? You know, this week is one of those cases. There's been a few recently where, you know, on the day we should be finding value, we get yet another number, <laughs> NFP today. So FOMC and NFP, you know, boom, boom. So, you know, it's my opinion that we're going to see some fairly erratic trading till Tuesday or so, you know, the same pattern. NFP will be reacted to today, price, uh, the reaction to the reaction Monday, beginning of the week. It's the beginning of the month, you know, and, and we'll be we'll understand what the market really thinks also major earnings are all passed now we had a whole bunch of them the last weeks two weeks so it's at the point where um the market ought to tell us what it thinks you know we should understand value and if we continue doing what we're doing right now you know with this erratic up and down sweep 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 big volume node sweep you know that, that's what we've been seeing and that, that's just price discovery and it's very very hard if not impossible to trade and so you really have to be mindful that that's what's going on. And if you look at the TPOs, you know, we're right in the middle of that. I, I spoke about this um, this morning when we did the NFP session. We're trying to form a range up here. But at the moment, you know, we're right at the point where the range from an economic event usually breaks back down. You know, it's usually within a day or two, right? And so go back to any older example you know, and I'll, I'll just blow this one up for a second so you can see what I mean. Like, you know, that number day back there or this one back here, you know, we see it over and over again. So we did retrace a little bit on the news this morning, but um, then we recovered pretty, pretty nicely. I mean, the, the recovery was pretty visual. And so, um, you know, if you look at the overall session, hang on, I'm just trying to get this back into roughly scale with the other ones. And look at YM. YM is just in this giant range and really hasn't reacted to anything much. You know, it's had sympathetic reactions, but it, it's working a really good range. And none of the others are. All three of the others broke out. I mean, that's really obvious. So the question is, are they going to come back into the range or is why I'm going to catch up and join the party? And the mistake you can make asking that question, and this is a really good point, um, the mistake you can make asking that question is this one. Um, YM already recovered. These are the, the dailies for two years. And YM has had the most significant bounce off the lows. The others are still much lower. You know, 30% retracement for NQ and RTY, you know, between 38 and 50 and 50% for ES. And, you know, YM is approaching 70% retracement. It's, um, it's, it's already stable up here. So, that's an important point, and um, keep that in mind. And oh, by the way, I just I forgot to introduce this session properly. Uh, on the Dino session each week, we do two things: we do a quick re weekly recap, which I'm doing right now, and then we do a psychology piece um, after that for 15 or 20 minutes. And so I'm doing the recap right now. Today's psychology piece is about you know dealing with losses and drawdowns and you know bad sequences of bad trades, um, the psychology of that. So anyway, I'll get to that in a minute, but let's go back to this. Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this range has yet to prove itself. It's trying, <laughs> um, but, you know, there's nothing but air above us. There's single prints below us. And the old range, which is fairly strong, we, we kind of have been working it for, you know, a couple of months, um, is is right below us. So, you know, I, I, I if, you're, if you're with the CRG, uh, IDES meetings up in the last two Mondays. The, the hedge fund guys were betting 
on whether we'd get to 4,200 or 3,800 first. And the consensus was pretty much 4,200. Well, guess what? We did it. Um, and But the, the conversation that they're having is, you know, what happens next is really significant. You know, this is the, the ambush zone and a sell-off from here could be all, you know, it could make new lows. That's not what we're seeing in the trading though. We're seeing this kind of, you know, erratic, uh, sweepy, thin stuff. And um, so anyway, um, I wouldn't draw a lot of conclusions from this week. You know, the people that are getting all bullish and saying the bear market's over, I think that's premature. The people that are saying, you know, there's a guy on Twitter, you know, I'm, I am I doubled down. Now I'm doubled down short. You know, I'm either – and he's a, a guy a reasonable number of people follow. And um, he's, you know, now I'm, I'm doubling down. So I'll either be right or broke. <laughs> And uh, I, you know, I, I joked about the risk management of that. That that's not a very clever risk management setup. Um, so I, you know, I think that the psychology is you got to continue to be really, really um, opinionless and let the market tell you what it's going to do. You know, look at this. We just put a little price projector down at the bottom of that last rotation, and um, and we're, you know, <laughs> we're sitting up near the high here of um, of the overnight. So who knows? Who knows? Not I. And you know, the other thing that's notable is there's there's UB up at the top of the pullback and the session. And down here, you know, the price rejector on the pullback. So, you know, that the, there are trade setups and you can you can trade them. And um, but I think the danger is having an opinion. You know, that this could clearly go either way or both really aggressively. I said one other thing earlier today um, that I, I think is useful to repeat. Uh, we have an apex, and this is a really common pattern in the markets. You know, basically, looks like, and I'm drawing with my mouth, so bear with me. You know, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> and apexes aren't stable; they either become a range by staying in there, or we break out. And breaking out is much more common. So, uh, and breakout could go either way. You know, that's the whole point. Yeah, you could argue about flags and chart patterns as to which way it's going to break out. I never. Uh, concern myself with that stuff because it's just not important and it doesn't work well enough to, to be an edge. So why worry about it? Okay, let me put this back on pointer mode. Yeah, that tweet was hysterical. I think I saw you come or you liked it or something, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, it was very funny. I, I couldn't tell if he was being serious or not. I think he was sort of joking, but who knows? All right. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, very quick. And, and again, every, uh, when we do these weekly recaps, if there's something more important to talk about or, you know, more, I will. Other than what I've already said, you know, it's it's worthwhile to look at the internals today. You know, we opened really weak and we tried to bounce and we haven't really gotten anywhere, but, you know, the lows held and the market isn't selling off anymore. So that's what the equities are doing. And there were some pretty bad earnings reports yesterday, if you've been following that, um, you know, some misses. And uh, so we have a, a rainbow tape. It's Christmas. Whenever it's red and green like that, that's the market is not agreeing on what's going on. There's stuff that's up and there's stuff that's down. You know, so this tells me that the market's going to stay in the range until something pushes it out. And I think it's that's pretty much the story. So um, let's see if there are any questions or comments about the, you know, the, the weekly review part, which is the part I'm doing right now. Let me have them. Otherwise, we will segue off into the other topic. So I'll wait a minute or so here and let you put a question or comment up if you have it. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of get my other side here ready to do that other subject. So hang on one moment. Okay. I don't see any questions. Cool. All right. I'm going to go and turn the screen share off on here unless we need to be looking at you know the market. It's just distracting. And if I um, put it on my main monitor. I'll, I'll want to trade while we're talking, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to turn the screen share off. And so today's topic for the Dino part, and let me, again, if you haven't been to one of these before, just a quick introduction. Um, Dino the dinosaur, as in me, I have been trading in uh, on March 5th, coming out this coming March 5th, I will have been trading for 50 years. No exaggeration. I literally took the money I got for my birthday in 1973 over to my father's Dean Witter Reynolds office, and I opened a brokerage account with his permission and cosign and uh, started trading options. So, so I'm a dinosaur, and I'm also 63 years old, So, uh, or I will be on that same day. And um, 
you know, I'm not dead yet, but it's closer to that than the opposite. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on this side of the grass, but you never know how long that will be. So, so I started doing this, um, this series and what I want to talk about is just stuff I've learned, you know, tales from the pits, the tar pits, tales from, um, you know, getting things wrong and right. And um, today's subject is dealing with errors that you make or bad days and weeks. Um, and, you know, sometimes bad days become a bad week or a series of them. Drawdowns, you know, that topic. Um, and, and not so much, you know, technically how to manage them, you know, circuit breakers and that kind of thing. I'm not talking about that. But really what I'm talking about is the psychology of dealing with it because trading – and this and you know this comes up over and over and over and it will if you keep trading you're gonna you this is never gonna go away so it's a really important point you will make mistakes you will have bad days you will have bad weeks you will have at some point in your career hopefully they're not very long but you will have a drawdown where you know you're trading your own capital or somebody else's capital with a split and you know you just cannot get out of the gutter and you just you keep losing money and you know statistically that's likely to happen no matter how good you are um, i want to bring up a document real quick I, this was posted in the bit and we've talked about it before in risk management but i just think it's pertinent to this conversation so this is something that uh trader dante made a while back and it's really it's really cool because it, it, it's part of this whole equation that we're talking about how you deal with with losses and drawdowns and whatnot if the left uh, the left hand axis percentage you know, this is your your win rate. Okay, so right now my win rate is is ninety percent. So I mean, I'm right here. I'm call it. You know, depending on how far back you go, and um, fifty trade period, it's probably a little higher than that. So what this says is the probability of seeing it, at least you know this number below of consecutive losing trades over that period. And um, you know, even for somebody as consistently profitable scalping as me. There's a 38% chance that I'm going to have two in a row. There's a 5%, maybe even, you know, if you go a little bit, 15%, that I could have three in a row. And so I have to be able to survive this, and that's risk management. And we've talked about this over and over again. But you, I also have to be able to survive it psychologically. And that's really the hard one, because risk management is something you can learn to do. But managing your own psychology is something that, is very, very, very difficult to learn to do all by yourself without other people giving you, you know, kind of their experience with it. Um, so anyway, that, you know, and if your win rate is even, you know, respectable 60%, you know, there's a 100% chance you're going to have two in a row. There's a 70% chance you're going to have four in a row losers. Think about that for a minute. What would that do to your psychology if you saw four what looked like really good setups that met all your criteria and boom, 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 all four of them were the to your limit of loss per trade? What would that feel like? Well, let's talk about that because that happened to me this week. <laughs> um, and it happened because I made a mistake. And so, um, and, and when you make mistakes, stuff like that will happen. So what you need to do is you need to learn, first of all, uh, to just walk away from it. And so this happened a couple of days ago. Real quickly, just to tell you what it was. I was I was having a fairly profitable little day. Everything was going nicely. Um, I made a mistake and turned, I, I had my copier off and I turned it on by mistake. I didn't realize I had done it to go to five accounts instead of just the one I was trading kind of aggressively and doing pretty well with. And so I started trading and I, with those copies going and it still went pretty well for a while. But again, the risk wasn't commensurate because I wasn't thinking I was trading with that much leverage. I thought I was just trading in one account. And so I saw a setup that was, eh, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't bad. I probably shouldn't have taken it. If I, it was, if I knew I was copying, I never would have taken it. But in the account that I was already up a lot, it looked like, yeah, this could work. And so I took it and immediately got hammered. And that's one of the reasons you don't want to just take uh, seat of the pants trades is they often do that to you because you really don't understand the context. But also, um, it can just happen. The reason I put that document up there, that could happen just randomly to you. And if your risk management is good, it should never wipe you out. But what it did to me was it it, it hit daily circuit breakers on those, those uh, funded accounts that I was copying to because they didn't have the profit cushion in there. And I was trading more risk than I would normally have traded with those. That's that's the mistake that I made. So all of those hit their daily limit. 
And so it ended up being a you know significant little hit, like a grand. It was like two hundred bucks each, two hundred fifty bucks each. And um, so you know, first thing you do, you shut down, you walk away, you have to clear your head. And I was kicking myself because I knew it was a mistake I made. It didn't ruin any of the accounts. They're all doing well. They're all funded accounts. But it, it just made what was a good day into a negative day. And um, you know, one account was way up, and five were down by the, the daily limit that I have set on them, a couple hundred bucks. So, it really frustrating from a psychological point of view. First thing you got to do, you got to get away from it. You have to walk away. Critical, critical, critical. It, it, nah. There's a lot of psychological babble that I can talk about to you know explain the psychology of this, but it's really simple. You're really, really likely to revenge trade in those circumstances or continue adding to the losses. You're, you're just not in your zone. You're not focused. You're thinking about that. So, so that was the first thing I did. I shut down. I went and did something else for the rest of the day. And, and then I came back to it uh, that evening. And, and, and so this is my part two. Part two is, so the first thing is walk away, take a break. And for, that can mean different amounts of time for different people. For me, I've taught myself to meditate and clear my head and go running. And so I can usually sleep on it and be fine if it was a, a major event. This wasn't, but a mistake that was preventable frustrates me. I'm better than that. I know it. I still make them. But um, what it what it allows me to do is just say, okay, I, I'm over the emotion of it. I've, I've burned up that adrenaline. I went for a run with the dogs and I came back and I said, okay, now what happened here? And this is the part you have to do. You have to reconstruct your mistake, accept where you were right and wrong and what happened. And there's some psychology to that. So we're going to talk about that next. Let me just look at the, yeah, good, good comment, breaking down what you know, exactly. Um, what about your blink? I'm not sure what about it, <laughs> Sven. Um, I, I understand the term. Obviously, I use it all the time. I'm not sure how you're, what you're asking me about it. Uh, break down into pros and cons. Uh, you came in without preparation. Well, actually not, not, Sven. So um, I, I came in and I did my context view. And I, I knew what was going on, and I put on the trade thinking I was in an account that was already up substantially. It was up about $2,000, that other account, same size account. These are all maybe uh, $1,500 drawdowns. So you know, if I look at a, a risk-reward and expected value opportunity, when I'm up that much, I might risk some of that because I'm really not worried about if a day is plus $2,000 or you know, plus $1,900. That's the kind of thinking, or plus $1,800. The, the risk is acceptable in one place. But when there, it's multiplied by that and then five more, which is, that's the mistake. So, and and it, was, it was just a visual problem. I'm having a flow in my left eye. I have an infection in my left eye, and I can't see on my left. And it, my left monitors were all my administrative stuff is and, and the copier. And I just, I accidentally clicked on turning it on for those accounts and I didn't realize it. So um, so it wasn't that I came in without preparation. I was prepared. I, I made a mistake of using more leverage than I had planned because I didn't realize I was using all that leverage. Does that make sense? Um, so it's not that the decision was a bad one. Again, I'm going to break down. Okay. Um, so let's see another comment here. Seems like compounding effects of interruptions or the unexpected seems to cause. Oh, absolutely, Thomas. That's why you have to use circuit breakers. And I talk about that in the risk management courses that I've done. Um, yeah, yeah, that you, focus. That's a completely different ball game. Um, I'm talking about the point where you've already had that happen. How do you deal with the result, the bad result? Uh, without you know the resulting part of it, which is you know what caused it to happen. That the, the way you improve, and in, and this is true of emotions also. The way you improve is by when you once your emotions are clear, you and you can look back objectively. What did I do right and wrong? What what is the problem here? And can I prevent myself from doing it again? So part of this, it would be very easy to say, oh, I I made a mistake. I was copying. I didn't mean to. And I and I that happened. Okay, is there a way to have that not happen next time? Well, obviously, if I didn't have an infection in my eye, it would have been less likely to happen, but that's a cop out. Um, that's an excuse. That's not right either. What actually went wrong on the trade? And so, so this is what I want to deconstruct because if you look at the pieces of it, there was no really bad decision. It was, it was just a combination. So th that's where I'm going. So hang on, bear with me. I'll come back. And uh, Thomas, Really, really important to your points, and, and I'll just throw it in here 
right now just so you don't have to go back and watch the risk classes, although they're worth watching. But um, I use circuit breakers for that. So if I ever have, uh, for example, and my circuit breakers are really simple. Uh, I, I will allow two trades to go wrong in a row. If a third trade does, that's it for the day. I'm done. And in this case, it was two trades in a row that caused this. And I'll explain again in a minute. Um, and if that happens two days in a row, it's the, it's the circuit breaker for the week. I will never go back and try to fight back. I've learned that once I have losses happening like for the reasons you said if i'm distracted or i get in that you know oh i got to make it back now that revenge kind of mode that never works out well the absolute best that has ever worked out for me is i can take a mistake and i can get back to maybe zero and you know break even for the day and that's sometimes not worth even trying to do and an example is the one i'm talking about i wouldn't even try it under the circumstances what happened to me so here's what happened um so I sat down, I saw the, the, the context, I saw you know, how much risk I might be able to take. And, and in my mind, I was risking about 200 more dollars because I thought I was in one account. That's how I was thinking. And so I looked at it and I, I put on one trade and immediately it went against me. And the market, the market was at an inflection point, okay? So that trade went against me and I immediately got out of it and it was like 90 bucks and that's, yeah, that's nothing. A $90 loser is perfect. I try to keep them under $100, any mistake I make. And the problem was the setup kind of set up again very, very quickly. And again, I wasn't totally focused. I didn't realize that I was in six accounts. And I saw it and it set up again and I took it again. And you know, you have to get used to that if you have a really high win rate setup. And as soon as I took it the second time, whatever was causing the skittishness, uh, the market went both ways really quick. It was a price discovery shock. Some, some, th there wasn't any economic announcement or anything like that, but there was just you know, one of those inflection points that got suddenly very wild. And it took me out to the stop point, so I flattened it. And then it immediately went the other way a lot. So you know, if, I had, if I had put it at $220 for my loss limit for that idea, uh, the trade would have made about 500 bucks. So the risk and the reward were balanced. The risk management wasn't balanced. And the psychology of seeing it set up, not work, get out of it. And, and this is the key point. I got out of it properly within my normal risk management. I only lost like 80 or 90 bucks. It sets up again. I'm like, okay, now it's even better. I mean, the setup looked really good for the risk I was taking. I, you know, I wouldn't have done it again across six accounts had I known, but for the account I was in, it was a really good opportunity to push that a little bit without losing a lot of money. And then something hit the market and it was one of those, con those events that I just have no control over. I don't know when that's going to happen, but it blasted down. I got out of it quick again. And the second half was like a hundred and Oh, let's see. It was. Uh, it ended up being out two twenty. Something was like a, a hundred and twenty on the second one. So the two combined is what hit a very normal and a very reasonable loss limit for the day of two hundred bucks. The problem again was the mistake of I was leveraging that across six accounts and not realizing I was doing that. So as soon as I realized I did that, basically, like I said, I took a really good day and I gave most of the profit back in accounts I hadn't been trading. Um, and the one that I had been trading was still fine. You know, it, it went down 200 bucks. It was still very profitable for the day. And this is really, really, really frustrating. Number one, like I said, hang on a second, I'm just opening my window here, get a little air. Uh, number one, like I said, I know better than that. Um, is there a way to, you know, not make a visual mistake? There's a lot of good ways to prevent yourself from, you know, making them regularly, but you're going to make... You know, fat finger errors, they're sometimes called in the industry where you trade too much size or you click on the wrong instrument or everyone in this room has done the following. I've heard it from all of you tell me this. You know, I thought I was in MES and I was in ES, you know, and so that's the exact same mistake. You're taking more risk than your brain has has uh, pre-planned. Remember, with risk management, what you want to do is you want to accept the worst scenario before you put the trade on. So then if the worst scenario happens, you're fine. If my scenario had been, well, the two losers, I'm down 200 and change on that one account, I'm still profitable, I totally had pre-accepted that. But that wasn't the scenario that I was in. There was a difference between reality and my reality. 
And so, you know, I flattened everything out. Like I said, I took a break, ran the dogs. I came back and deconstructed. And I said, okay, so there really isn't a lot of bad decision-making here, except the mistake. Why do I feel so horrible? Because I felt like such an idiot. I was like, gosh, now, you know, every one of those copied accounts took a, a $200 hit. They're all profitable. That's not a problem. But, you know, it cost me a, a day in every one of those accounts. And, and I don't, you know, I, I don't want that to happen. There's, there's no excuse for that. But guess what? It's going to happen over and over again to you. And sometimes it's going to even get worse. Uh, one day like that will start you picking yourself. And remember last week, I talked about how important it is to protect your confidence. Well, this isn't a horrible confidence killer, but it, you know, it, from the PL resulting point of view, I felt like I'd made a big dollar mistake. And that just, you know, there's no way to reconcile that emotionally. You can't, there's no solution. And that's what, what human beings try to do. We try to figure out the solution. There isn't one. What can you do? Well, you can try to not make the mistake that caused it again. You know, what can I do? And that's where I went. And so that that's the short answer for this one. How can I set up the copier so that it it, it, it asks me to confirm or, and, and I figured out a way to do that. It's, it's a window on my platform. And if it's not open, it's not running. And so going forward, I'm not just going to leave it open with nothing copying. I have the platform now set that when I bring it up, the copier is not even running. And if I want to turn it on, I have to open that window. It opens up. Then I select what I'm copying to. As soon as I'm done copying, close the copier again. So I'm always in single account mode unless I deliberately go back and put myself into multi-account mode. That's my solution. And that, you know, that should make it pretty hard to ever do that again. It doesn't make me feel any better about the thousand dollar loss, but I've taken the negative and I've turned it into a process that prevents it from happening again, at least to the best I can. And Stay on that thought for a second, because sometimes this goes on into an extended drawdown. And and I, I, as a kind of research for this conversation real quickly, I, I reached out to a couple of friends who I know have been through this. And, um, and, and what I mean this is an extended drawdown where, you know, a, a really successful trader with 20 years of, you know, profitable trading will go through six months where they can't buy a profitable week, no matter what they do. It's just every week is either scratch or a little loser. And so it just keeps chipping away at the equity. And then every now and then maybe you get emotional and you have a worse day. And so the equity goes down a little bit more. And this is a really common occurrence for professional full-time traders uh, to get in a drawdown like that. And it's really, really hard to keep your psychology clear when that's happening. And for me, this example that happened this week is a good example of dealing with that. It, it's a really good opportunity to go back and really question processes. So after I figured out that if I turn the copier off and have to turn it on manually, that I shouldn't do that again, I decided to do something else. I, I went through all of my point of view and all of the tools that I use, the ways I measure volume and the price action. And, and I literally questioned every single one of them again. Do I need this thing here? Is this thing doing what I want it to do? And uh, would it have helped me with this decision? Could I have made a better decision? And so I kind of reconstructed those two trades and I realized something else about it. And again, this is, if you're not emotional, you can do this. If you're emotional, you'll never be able to do this. I promise you, because I've tried when I was emotional. It just can't be done. Um, I went back and I looked and looked at the two. And I remember a minute ago, I just described it as they were roughly the same setup. I deconstructed them a little farther and they weren't roughly the same setup at all. It looked like it. But if I had really, really been focused, I would have realized there was a subtle difference and, and it's not important what it was, but the second trade was really the good one. The one that, that got me to the loss limit. And again, this is something that's happened before where I will try an idea a couple of times in a row and maybe lose money and give up on the idea. And then that idea works perfectly. <laughs> Um, so, and, and so how do you deal with that? You know, most people react to that with revenge trading and, you know, they go and keep trying it over and over again. And I looked at it and I said, okay, this is again, that example where, what could I have done better here? I talked about a process, turn the copier on and off. 
what could I have done a little better? Well, uh, it came up in the chat when Sven was asking me about, you know, my blink and coming in without the preparation. By the way, the blink is not really preparation. Blink is when you have so much experience that it just, everything's automatic for you. And it's pretty much like that for me, but I asked the question you're asking me, is there something in my perception when I walk up to the computer, you know, and, and do my, my quick context, is there something I could do better? And I realized there is. And um, it's the difference between those two setups that on first glance, when I was trading a little bit emotionally, because now the first one didn't work. And then I saw it again. And the second one didn't work. And I got flat, but then it really worked after that. I was already flat. I didn't chase it. That was a good decision. But it turns out the two were slightly different. The second one was a much better setup. So here's another takeaway. If I hadn't done the first one, the second one wouldn't have come anywhere near my loss. It would have been a really, really profitable trade. So what is that telling me? Well, these conditions we've got are kind of crazy. We're moving around a lot. The market's thin. We're seeing lots of sweeps. So the takeaway from that is, a reinforcement of something we've been saying over and over again, that this is a market to only take really, really clear, good setups. So the first takeaway was make that clear. I'm rearranging my point of view a little bit, taking something off so that it's, it's really obvious the difference between those two setups. And then don't take the one that you're not sure about, particularly if you're making a mistake and have too much leverage, which is really a separate mistake. But that second one I was correct in taking it. So I didn't make a mistake on the one that blew me out of the day to the loss limit. I made the mistake on the one before that. And this was mind boggling to me. Even after 50 years, things mind boggle me. That if, if you had asked me about that any time the previous the, the day, you know, when I made the mistake, any time, you know, when I was walking the dogs. I would have said, no, 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 the setup is the same. I would have argued with you to the end of the earth. But the next, that evening, that more next morning for me, when I sat down and really dissected the two trades, they weren't the same trade. One was significantly better, and I just wasn't dialed in enough to see that. And that'll happen too, you know? So, so here's the quick takeaway on this. Number one, you've got to forgive yourself. You will make mistakes. I don't care how good you are. This is true in anything that is that that people are really, really excel at in a small group. Look at Formula One, you know? All it takes to, to drive a Formula One car into the wall and wreck a million dollar car is, is losing focus for a second. Or there's a tiny patch of oil on the track and that's not your fault. Or, you know, the guy next to you goes for the apex and doesn't see you and bumps you and your car flips over. And you know, it, it's just an instant. And that doesn't make you a better or worse driver what you have to do is look at that, you know, get over the initial impact of it and then dissect it, really try to break it down. And sometimes um, in the case of long drawdowns, that's just not possible. And so I, I want to tell you, if you trade long enough, you will go through a period where everything just isn't working and you'll try changing stuff. You'll try, you know, looking at more, more uh, data points. You'll try looking at fewer data points. And no matter what you do, you can't get it right. And um, it, it's just kind of the odds. If you take the, the Dante document and just extend that over 20 years, you know, the odds are really high that you're going to end up with an extended drawdown. And, and you have to pre-prepare for that psychologically, I think. Um, it's part of this game. And the vast majority of people, including myself in the past, when they, when they have something like that happen, like Thomas was describing, they start disintegrating and they get into effort mode and, you know, oh, it's only an eval. Oh, it's only a funded account. I'll, 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 I'll make another one. I'll get another one. And your brain just goes into complete idiot mode. And, and then you'll really beat yourself up after that because the, the consequences will be so much more profound. So, um, you know, use circuit breakers to get you out of the immediate problem and make sure whatever risk you're taking at any time. I mean, again, none of those five accounts was was damaged at all in the big picture. You know, it, it just was a daily loss and, and they're all very profitable and it's nowhere near the drawdown. And so, you know, I didn't ruin my year because I never will take enough risk to do that. That's, in, that's risk that's not commensurate with what you're doing. But it still feels like that when you, you know, it, it's, there's this desire to, um, to be perfect. And that's why I shared that Dante document. 
even if you've got an 80, 90% win rate, which is too high, you know, let's say you're a good consistent 70% or you've got a really good win loss ratio and you're at 40%, you're still going to have runs where, you know, you'll have sequences of bad trades in a row and sequences of bad days in a row and bad weeks in a row. And you might have bad months and you have to understand that that, that psychology will just beat you up and pound you into the ground. So you have to break the, the emotional cycle first, and then you have to deconstruct it. You may or may not be able to improve yourself. You probably can improve yourself because there's always ways to improve whatever you're doing, your technique, your execution. But, um, you know, forgive yourself that you did whatever you did. I mean, I can only protect myself from not copying when I don't want to, to a certain extent. I, you know, it's possible that I could do that again. And I'm trying to make it so that it isn't, but, you know, I still feel really stupid for having made that mistake. And um, and you have to get over that. You have to forgive yourself for that. So, um, so that's kind of my, my broad stuff about drawdowns and consecutive losers and things like that. And, and one other more personal thing I want to add to this, and, and some of you touched on it in the comments, and I'll go back to the comments in just a minute. Um, if you have personal stuff going on, and there's a couple of you in the audience I know this is true of right now, your ability to perceive what you're doing right and wrong in your trading will be severely impacted. That's a true statement. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean you can't trade when you're under personal stress or, you know, in a relationship issue or you have health issue or whatever. I, I do it every day. I have to because I have health issues. But you you have to understand when it makes you incompetent. And those are questions of degree, you know. And if there's any question at all of your competence, you have to not trade that day or trade in a sim. Because the emotional damage you can do to your confidence, even if you just play in the sim, is significant. And, um, and you won't necessarily connect the dots to your, you know, your external factors. And um, so, you know, gosh, uh, as time goes on, you know, most of you are relatively new. Some of you have been trying for you know, a while to get profitable. This one comes up more and more the more successful you get. This is the last piece of this that I want to say. And that sounds counterintuitive. Well, why would it happen more and more the more successful you get? Because you have fewer and fewer periods where you're not consistently profitable the more successful you get. So then when you have one, it's like, okay, what did I do differently? This was working so well last month. I've been so good for, I've, I've had 25 consecutive profitable days. I've had 50 consecutive profitable weeks, and now I can't buy myself a trade that works. What's going on? Well, you know, it could be a conditions change. We talked about that a couple of dinos ago. But the first question I always ask, you know, yeah, conditions change, that's usually pretty obvious, but what's different about me? I'm the trader. What am I doing differently? Am I doing something differently? Are my emotions in check? Am I distracted? You know, do I have a headache? Did I not sleep last night? Whatever it is. And, um, and I find it, it that that it's that at least as as often as it is conditions changing, sometimes a lot more. And it took me forever to accept that. I kept looking at that as a personal failure. If I if I would have anything go wrong, or if I made mistakes that I knew better about, I would just look back. I know better than that. I'm such an idiot. And you know, I used to beat myself up for days and. You know, it would ruin my whole week. And and uh, one of my my coaches once helped me work through that. You know, you have to understand the nature of the business you're in. This is the nature of the business we're in. It's it's once you have an edge, it's all about psychology. It's not about finding the latest indicator or faster computer, or whatever. It's a psychological game. It really is. And you have to accept that and understand how that what that means for you. And you know, everybody's different, but for me. Um, the, the, the couple of things that, that made the difference was one, the thing I talked about last time, which is, you know, just, I just defend my confidence with body armor and machine guns. Nothing will affect my confidence. I, if you get, if you lose your confidence, you're screwed. You have to nurture that. And then when you do make mistakes, 
You got to forgive yourself. Then you got to go back and deconstruct it. What can I learn from this? How could I do it better next time under the same circumstances? And, um, and you know, you'll often find there's something really simple, like my copier, you know, turn it off. And if I have to physically turn it on, it's a much more dis- deliberate decision than it just loading automatically with Ninja. Yeah, it's more convenient if it loads automatically, but it takes me three seconds to pop a new window open with it, you know? So why put yourself in that position? And, um, you know, and understand, obviously, copying means more leverage. So that that's a, a decision to use more leverage is what I'm talking about. All right, let me go back to the comments. Oh, boy, there's a lot of good comments. Let's see here. Let's spread it out so I can see them. Okay, by having risk management, you can discover, I'm starting, let's see, we got to that. No, let me go up a little higher. Okay. So Thomas was saying the compound effects of interruptions are the unexpected. Absolutely. that, And that snowballs mistakes. And that's why you have to understand your competence that has to be part of your process and then understand when you walk away and for me the worst case ever is if i have three consecutive losers the day's over that that's a rule i will never break no matter how big they are they could be three losers of ten dollars i'm doing something wrong i'm not tuned in i'm i'm walking away and sometimes i'll come back later in the day and start over but most of the time that's it for the day it's 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 Definitely a walk away for some period of time when that happens. And, um, and I've also found as part of that is if I'm ever in, a, in a, a, a loss for the day, that depending on why I'm in that loss, um, trying to improve it often just makes it worse. And so I, I really question that now when I, when I try to fight back to break even if I'm having a bad day, because bad days are so rare <laughs> that usually there's a cause that fighting back to break even may or may not be a good idea. So that's a really important decision to put in there. And then, um, you know, make yourself walk away. That has to happen. So David, uh, by having risk management, you can discover mistakes. Oh, you rewrote that. Okay. You can discover a mistake that cause faults in your trading. Oh, absolutely. That there has to be a feedback loop. And this is true of any professional endeavor. Formula one, really good example. You know, why did I lose it in, you know, turn four? Well, you know, did I hit it too fast? Did I, did the brakes lock up? Did, you know, if you understand racing, you know, there's a lot of different things that can cause a mistake. Sometimes you just make a mistake, but the better you get at it, the, the less frequently that happens. And it's some factor and you have to really break that apart. That's a really good thing to do. And then see if you can figure out a way to make it so that it doesn't happen again. Um, in other words, build it into your process. Uh, yes, wow, even with micros. Oh, yeah, micro NQ, MNQ can can spank you very, very fast, Thomas. Uh, again, I, I didn't want to go into too much about the details of the trade because that's really not what's important. But yes, um, people that, yeah, if, you, if you don't trade NQ or MNQ, you don't understand that. But it, yeah, it can move really, really fast a lot. Uh, let's see. But, 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 but. Bar. So when we try to judge ourselves, what is a way to stop doing that? And stick with the facts only. Oh, this is so hard. Um, it, the, the first step, Bar, is just you have to understand that that's something you have to teach yourself. It took me ten years, twenty years to understand that was even a problem I had to do. Was was you know stick with the facts because I, I confused. I didn't understand that there was emotion to the decision and and the results and the actual thing that happened. It, I thought my perceptions were always accurate. You know, that's a common human mistake. So yeah, I find something that clears my body and head out, you know, go to the gym, go for a run. You know, when I used to ride a race, you know, take something fast out on a course, come back with my head totally cleared. And then this is how I do it. And this is a really good question, Bar. I'm glad you asked it. The way I do it is I assume I'm somebody else. And if I can't do that, I ask someone else to sit next to me for a minute or to get on the phone with me and just, they don't have to say anything. I just explain to them what, what's going on. And when you try to explain it to somebody else, you, you aren't emotional because you have to just give them the facts, right? They don't know how you feel. So that taught me to break the two apart. And once I was able to do that, I realized how crazy it was to get caught in the emotion and, and how the facts, like this particular set of facts, it really was only two trades in a row that were bad. And one of them, deconstructing it, was not nearly as good a setup as I thought it was, probably because I was distracted. And, um, and, but there is a way I could see that the second one was better than the first one by changing some of the stuff on my point of view, on my, my uh, trading platform layout, where that situation is much clearer now. And I wouldn't have taken the first one under those circumstances. And the second one, I would have gone in really aggressively. 
not copying trades, but I would have gone in aggressively. So I learned from that. I fixed it. I made a process. My copier is turned off by default. And, and all of that, you know, should, should help me emotionally feel better too, because I'm, I'm working to solve the problem. I'm not just caught up in the fact that I had a loss that I don't want to have. And um, the other piece of this that you learn to do that with, to your question, is you have to understand that that the profitability curve in um, trading. And here, let me go back to my main my uh, main screen here because I just want to draw real quickly. So let me turn on my the moving toolbar problem. All right, so here we go. Th there's a really good thing posted. Actually, it's posted in the pit too. It's uh, the the ca it's a cartoon that ca caption is success, and it's you know it says. Success doesn't look like this. It says that success looks 